get started. Not all at once. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> there we go. So, what morning. so welcome back. We are in week two of our look at Exodus 20. I said last week we're spending two weeks on this chapter because it's the centerpiece of the book. And in many ways it is one of the most important sections in the Old Testament. Right up there with Genesis 15, Genesis 12. Um, <clears throat> it's all about it's all about Exodus. From here moving forward, this chapter will mark the beginning of everything that the Hebrew prophets call Israel back to. So whenever you're reading the prophetic books, the ones with the weird names that you don't understand, Obadiah, Nahum, Habakkuk, uh, Haggai, which everybody mispronounces as Haggai for some reason. Um, whenever you're reading those books and they're telling people that, uh, you know, Jeremiah and others are saying, return, return, turn back, turn back. They're not speaking about just a general, hey, be nice, we got to take this nation back for God kind of approach. They're literally telling the people, turn back to Exodus 20 and forward and start keeping those commandments. Start keeping that covenant because that's what you're violating. That's what you're breaking. So it's important that we know foundationally what's going on here. And this section, chapter 20, has been um, pulled out of its context and put up on posters and on monuments and courthouses and all kinds of stuff. And so it becomes this ethereal set of rules called the Ten Commandments that some people mistakenly believe by keeping you go to heaven. Or by keeping God doesn't judge your nation or, or any of these other beliefs that have come along. And that's not what's happening in this. These, these are the ten words. Scripture calls them the ten words. And they are given as the beginning of the rest of the commandments, the rest of the Torah. They're the part, they're the, uh, I don't want to say preamble, but they're like the, the basic gist of who God wants his people to be at a core level. And the rest of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy will unpack and unfold these commandments in different situations, how they apply. So all of the laws that come after this hinge on these ten, and these ten can be boiled down to the two greatest, which are paraphrased elsewhere in Torah, love God, love your neighbor. So when Jesus appeals to the two great commandments, even though he doesn't cite one of these ten, he cites the two in Scripture from Deuteronomy and Leviticus, which specifically summarize all ten of these. And that is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And the, the Ten Commandments break down into that structurally. If you like structure, there's a, a pretty clear, interesting way, at least, to, to look at the pattern of the commandments. Commandments, they basically are broken into, there's three sections. There's the commandments that deal with God and our relationship to God. Then there's the commandment that deals with our relationship to the God figure in our life, which is our parents. And then there's the relationship that deals with our relation among our equals. So it's this three-tiered section of the commandments. This moves from God to those who are God to us in our formative years, which is our parents, then to those who are our equals socially speaking, which is everyone else. So there's that structure. So it takes care of the vertical and the horizontal relationships, us and God, us and each other. But then within that, there's also a neat uh, chiastic structure where the first two commandments, or depending on how they're broken up in some traditions, they're just seen as one commandment, but it's uh, about God. The first two involve our thoughts, how we think about God inwardly. And then commandment number three is our words how we speak about God, and then commandment four is our deeds and how we worship God. Then there's the bridge commandment of honoring our parents, which is a very general, broad commandment that gets us into the next section, and it's done inversely. Our deeds, commandment six through eight, how we treat others, our words, commandment nine, and then our thoughts, commandment ten. So it's this really cool structure, the way that the commandments are set up, that basically give Israel the message, these are to be formative for you as a people. These are to characterize you as a people. And the commandments, they aren't, uh, these aren't judicial commandments. The judicial stuff's going to come. These are the moral foundation upon which the judicial decisions will be rendered. 
Because these commandments aren't enforceable all the time. They aren't enforceable. You can't enforce the commandment against coveting. And you can't even judge that. Only God can judge that commandment. Now later there will be penalties for things that you do or things that you say in situations, but they flow out of these things. And we looked last week when uh, I was in my jet lag state coming back from an overnight flight. So we muddled through the first three. Get the video if you missed it. But we looked at the first ones that deal with the relationship with God. And they were concerned with idolatry. They were concerned with keeping Israel from falling into the idolatry that characterized the Canaanites who they were being sent in to drive out as punishment for their idolatry. And they were also to separate Israel from the idolatry from the, the, the Egyptian pantheon that they had just come out of after 400 years of slavery. So these commandments are aimed at creating a new type of worshiper, the people of God. And they were going to be different. They were going to be holy. We talked about holiness and what that meant. Set apart, being separate, being different, being unique among all the peoples of the world. So the commandments, you know, I'm the Lord God, I brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods, alpanay me, before me, to my face, is what it literally says. Alpanay means, you know, to the face of or to the presence of. There will be no other gods in my presence. Well, where can you go that's out of God's presence? Nowhere. So the implication is there are no other gods that you will worship. Regardless of what your pagan neighbors think, regardless of the evil spirits and the demonic and the spirit realm and all that other stuff, whatever they call them, they are not gods. And you're not to worship them. And then building on that is uh, you shall not make yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven or on earth, beneath the earth or in the waters below. That's what all the other cultures did. They took their gods and they formed them, formed these little idols that were in the shape of things in the heavens like birds, things in the earth like cattle, things under the earth like the things that swim from the sea, sea monsters and serpents and dragons, all that kind of stuff. These were the gods of the ancient world. And the ancient world felt in order to properly worship a god, you have to have a visual subject. You have to have a connection to that god, something visual, tangible, that actually indwells that idol. So there would be these elaborate rituals. You'd make an idol, you'd carve it, you'd get a craftsman to create this little image of Asherah or Marduk or Baal or Ra or any of these things. And then there would be this long process, this involved process of making the God or getting the God to come and indwell this image. And what God in, in, in the Bible is saying is that that only happens once. And it's at creation. When God creates his image, which is not anything carved with human hands, but it was created his hands from the dust of the earth. And he breathed into his image the human which became a living being. God's whole concept of theology is that we are his idol. We are the image of God. We human beings represent him and are gifted or given his image, the imago Dei, the image of God. So nothing can substitute for that. So it's, it's, it's not just blasphemy, but it's, it's, um, it's a denigration of who we are to assign or ascribe worship to anything else in creation. The intertestamental writers between the Old and New Testament, they would talk about this in books like the Wisdom of Solomon. They would talk about how the Gentile earth, how the pagan earth became so corrupt because they ran after idols of their own making. And Paul will pick up on that Wisdom of Solomon passage, which most of us aren't familiar with, but it's, if you read it, it's in there. And he'll almost verbatim quote it, or at least allude to it strongly in Romans 1, where he talks about how the creation ruined itself by exchanging the truth of God for a lie, worshiping and serving the creature rather than the creator. And the result of that was all of the sin that we see in the world. And Paul goes through and lists all kinds of examples of corruption. So the so this commandment against idolatry is not just don't make a carved statue, but it's don't enter into the realm of that, of idolatry worship. Uh, then the commandment after that is... The third one, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. For the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. And we talk about the literal meaning, the literal wording of that is you shall not lift up in emptiness or lift up in uselessness. Or, or the word that's translated it has the meaning of 
nothingness. You know, so just flippantly saying, using the name of Yahweh when you're in a court. You know, people saying, oh, I swear to God. This would say, no, don't you dare swear to God. That's flippant use of his name. If you swear to God, you are swearing on the most holy thing in existence. And you better do it in a courtroom setting where your life is on the line if it's that important to you. That's what it's talking about here is don't use God's name emptily, flippantly. Um, commonly, but it also re refers to God's, you know, who He is. Don't don't represent because what it's about using the name of something is to represent that thing. Don't represent God in a way that's flippant, and that could be anything. That could, I mean, all of these commandments have specific original intents, and then they have extrapolations that you can imply from these. So, for example, the prohibition against using God's name in vain. Uh, a modern, like a trickled down version of that would be people that go around listening to Christian music with Christian bumper stickers on their car and then flipping people off in traffic. Or people that, you know, quote the Bible on their Facebook all day, but then they tip lousy at restaurants. Like, th when, you, when you quote the name of God and you take on the identity of Jesus and then you live in a way that contradicts that, that is taking God's name in vain. That's using his name flippantly. Because he, he has caused his name to dwell within us. He, he, we, we are his representative on the source. So the Ten Commandments, they don't just stop at, and that's the mistake of the Pharisees, is they would try to find an original point that the commandments were saying, like don't take the name of the Lord in vain, and then they would build a hedge around it and say, okay, well, so that we don't accidentally break that, we're going to just not say his name at all. And so you got Hebrews saying Hashem or Adonai instead of Yahweh, so thinking, well, we're safe because we aren't saying the name of the Lord, so we can't take it in vain. And Jesus comes along, and even other Jewish prophets would come along and say, you're missing it. You're missing the point. You can keep the law legally and still break the whole spirit of the commandment. So the, the use of God's name in vain extends far more than just swearing or saying, oh my God, or, or whatever we do. It, it, it implies that, but it goes beyond that. Fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath. The NIV says, remember the Sabbath by keeping it holy. But literally, it's just two commandments. Remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. In the original Hebrew, that's what it is. Remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. And then he bases it in God's pattern. God gave us the pattern in Genesis. For six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. Neither you, your son, your daughter, your maidservant, your manservant, nor the animals, nor the alien within your gates. Because in six days the Lord God made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that's in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. God provided a blueprint at creation in the Genesis account. God worked for six days. He lay, he's presented, as we, those of you that were with us way back in the Genesis, we talked about how God was pictured as a common but exalted day laborer. He went about his work. Then there was evening, there was morning when he slept. And then the next day, he went about his work. Now, it's not that God is a big farmer in the sky or a craftsman in the sky, but he was being presented, the whole creation was being presented as a normal Hebrew work week. And no other people in the ancient world had this concept of a seven day week, because it's not based on a, moon, a lunar cycle, it's not based on a solar cycle, it's not based on anything in nature, it's an entirely artificial system, the seven day week. We're just so used to it, because that's all we've ever known, but it's, it's very artificial. And yet that's what God had chosen. That's a uniqueness that he instilled, this rhythm of six days work, one day rest. Six days work, one day rest. Now this became a source, an amazing source of legalism among early Jews and even early Christians who just switched it to Sunday, which the Bible never does. The Bible never says, Sunday is not the Sabbath. It never does that. The early Christians who were Jewish kept Sabbath and then they worshiped on Sunday. Um, early before they went out and did their work on Sundays. And then it just kind of over time got morphed into Christian as the, you know, Sunday is a Christian Sabbath, Saturday is a Jewish Sabbath, and that's just how it is. But it never, if you go read through it, that never happens. What you have is this pattern and this, this, this notion of one day is holy and the other days you work. And then when the New Testament comes along and Christians and Jews started having to get together and, and exist together in Jesus, there was this tension of, well, we think the Sabbath is the holy day and you Jew, Gentiles need to keep it. And Gentiles were saying, well, we've never kept Sabbath and we, we worship on the Lord's day because that's when Jesus rose. And there was this kind of uneasy existence. And that's what the New Testament deals with in a lot of places. 
But the point is that the Sabbath was given, as Jesus says, the Sabbath was given for humanity. The Sabbath was given for God's people to be a day of rest and more than just resting, a day when we cause others or enable others to rest. So it's like, it's not just you keep the Sabbath, it's you and everybody in your household, your whole people, you as a whole are going to rest, even your maidservant and your manservant. Even the immigrant among you, who's not even an Israelite, but who's living among you in your society, because this is going to be a communal thing. We're going, to, we're going to communally remember that God has given us this Sabbath. What's, what's the big deal? Why does it matter? Well, more than anything, it was a visible sign of the covenant. It was an outward sign of the covenant. Uh, unlike circumcision, Sabbath keeping is visible to everybody. And two is it was a test of faith. You had to believe that if I don't go out and work sundown Friday to sundown Saturday, the crops are still going to be enough. The, the finances are still going to be there. My livelihood doesn't depend entirely on my ability to produce. God is, is inviting a somewhat of a basically, hey, keep it and watch what I do. So the Sabbath is there. It's, it's, a, it's a test of faith. And a lot of people today, we... We try to get around that. You know, like, ah, well, I gotta work. If I don't work, how am I gonna eat? If I don't work, how am I gonna feed my family? If I don't and it's this this you know slave mentality of just we gotta earn, we gotta earn, we gotta earn. And what God says, He's got plenty of stuff to say later in the Bible about doing work, not being lazy, not being idle, working with your hands, all that stuff's good. But in the midst of that, the foundation of that is I get one day that's solely devoted to not providing for yourself. One day out of the seven. And, and it doesn't mean what the Pharisees and other groups came, developed it to mean, where it's like, by Jesus' day, they calculated how many steps you could take without breaking the Sabbath. Today, if you go to Israel, elevators don't run on the Sabbath because pushing the button is doing work. Uh, buses don't run because that's sort of like taking an animal around on the Sabbath. Like, it's, it's, it's bizarre how Orthodox Judaism and also some forms of Christianity have legalized to such a minute detail Sabbath keeping, and and it's and it's become not what it was originally intended. There was never a prohibition against walking somewhere. There was no prohibition against picking up your mat and walking, like the uh, paralytic that Jesus healed. None of that's in Scripture. That's all added on later. The prohibition was don't do your occupation one day of the week, whatever it is that earns you money to survive on. Stop for one day. And give that day to the Lord. And it's very broad too. It doesn't, there's no specifics on how you can keep it. Just remember it, keep it holy. And from there, the rest of the Torah would inform what that looks like. And situations would apply what that looks like. But it was at the heart of who Israel was. It was there, one of the most visible outward signs. Uh, then right after that, we move into the bridge commandment. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Now, I was always taught this as this teaches you do what your parents say. doesn't say that. The text does not say obey your mother and your father. It says honor. It says give them the, and the Hebrew word honor is the same root that comes from the word of glory. And, and, and it means like heaviness or weight or importance. And what it means is, this is not written to Israelite children. You guys realize that. This is not a commandment to Israelite children. This is to adults, to honor their adult parents. This is one of the things that's saying, you're a society that should take care of those who took care of you when you were brought into this earth. There's no, put them in a nursing home and forget about them. There's no, put them out the pasture and don't worry about it. There's none of that in, in now that was rampant in other ancient cultures. But in Israel, it was, no, 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 no. You care from someone, from the womb to the tomb. You're to care about them, and you're to honor them. Show them honor. Show them importance. Don't neglect them. Don't relegate them to the fringes of society when they're no longer seen as useful enough because they don't have the all-important fountain of youth that we all seek and crave. Hold them in high esteem. The grayer the hair, the greater the honor. We are super honored. Here. It's it's a it's a commandment to adult children to treat their parents in a way that reflects their obedience and their love for God. 
So it's all, it doesn't get into specifics. It doesn't give a list of do's and don'ts. This is just a general stance that we are to have towards our adult parents in their old age so that you may live long in the land. If every generation is doing that, then every generation will be cared for into their old age by the next generation who's coming up. So it's very different than just listen to mommy and daddy. That's how this was originally taught to us and how we hear it in Sunday school. It's a lot deeper than that. Um, now we move into the relationships among people. You shall not murder. If your Bible says kill, it's not accurate. The verb for kill is not the verb that's used here. There are a couple of words for kill in Hebrew. This is not the one for that. This is the word rasak. It means to uh, take life unauthorized. It means to either we use it for murder or manslaughter, but it's the unauthorized taking of life. It never refers to things like battle. It never refers to judicial executions. Um, it doesn't refer to meat eating or any of the things that people that kind of evoke thou shalt not kill and attach it onto their cause. It's not talking about you shall not. And murder is too specific a term, so that's not entirely accurate either. But it's, it's you shall not take life without authorization. And of course that needs a lot of unpacking, but the basic form here is preventing humans from taking the life of other humans in anger, in jealousy, in, in revenge, in any of those type of situations. That's what it's prohibited. You shall not commit adultery. In Genesis, way back in 39 with Joseph, we saw when Joseph was tempted to commit adultery with Potiphar's wife, his response was, how could I sin against God in this manner? In, in the Hebrew Bible, adultery is not just seen as a sin against the person whose spouse you slept with, although it was seen as that. It's a sin against God himself. Because what, all the way back in the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, I don't know if any of you were here then, but some of you were. In Genesis chapter 1, when the image of God was given, it was given as male and female, he created them. And that marriage union that was created in the beginning was the foundation of what it meant to be humanity created in God's image. So any attack on that marriage union, any, any, any um, entering into that marriage union and breaking it is adultery. It's an attack on the image of God. It's much more than just what we see it as today. It's just a flink. I, those of you that keep up with news, there's a website called AshleyMadison.com. And it's a website for people who are married who want to go have affairs. So it's a very discreet, you go in there, you put in your information, you choose a fake name or something, and, and then you can find other people who are married who want to have affairs. And it's kind of seen with a wink and a nod by pop culture. And um, just this last week, that website was hacked. And the hackers threatened if they don't shut the website down, they'll release all the information. Wow. And everybody, and there's millions of people on this site. And when I saw the news, I just laughed. And I just thought, you read what you saw. <laughs> this is not just some little, oh, boys will be boys, or oh, she just wanted a little adventure. This is a, this is a, it's a violation of the image of God. The, the, the seeking sexual relationship outside of a marriage covenant and particularly in which a marriage covenant has already been established is one of the gravest things you can do to violate and attack God himself. Right. There's a reason that adultery was a capital offense in Israel. And it still is today in many parts of the world. We see it as, eh, you know, it's, it's, I had a little affair, a big deal, or, or well, you know, we have an open marriage or anything. No, not in the ancient world of the Bible and not in the ethic of Scripture. Because the marriage union was seen as something that directly reflected and participated in the divine nature. And at the heart of it, at the core of it, was the sexual intimacy between the man and the woman, which was to reflect the intimacy between God and his people. So there's so much theology wrapped up in just that you shall not commit adultery uh, that, that it gets kind of overlooked. But you could spend a whole, you could spend weeks just on that, the theology of sexuality and all the stuff that kind of gets brushed aside. <clears throat> but we don't have weeks, we have minutes. So <laughs> the next, you shall not steal. You shall not steal, it's self-explanatory. You shall not take what is not yours. The uh, ninth commandment, 
You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor or bear false witness. It's not you shall not lie. There are times when lying is actually commended yeah. in Scripture, when deception is something that God himself allows and encourages for the purpose of upholding and preserving life, peace, you know, sanctity, all those things. This is not a simple you shall not lie, as some Christian ethicists have argued. The specific is you shall not give a false testimony against your neighbor. And the main application in this is the court setting. When someone was convicted of a crime and you were testifying either against them or for them, in Israelite rule of law, you were required to accept the penalty of whatever they were being charged with if you were found to be a lying witness. And, and because there was no um, hidden cameras back then, there's no DNA testing, there's no trial by jury of your peers and, and all of this you know, overwhelming evidence, it, it was eyewitness testimony. In fact, later scripture will say no one can be put to death unless there are at least two eyewitnesses who are willing to take that death penalty on themselves if they're found to be false. In scripture, lying under oath was one of the most damaging things you could do because it, 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 it determined the fate of another person. And so there had to be honesty. But that also extends, of course, just in general, is, is God wanted his people to not bear false witness, not just in a court under oath, but in general, in life. So that's why things like gossip and slander are put in the same category as things like murder and sexual immorality in the New Testament, not even in the Old Testament. Because in God's eyes, those are every bit as destructive, sometimes more destructive, than the physically destructive sins that we think about. Last one. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, or maidservant, his ox, his donkey, anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is not delineating those things that you can't covet, meaning everything else you can covet. <laughs> All right? What it's doing is it's giving pairs of things from across the spectrum of belongings, spouses belong to one another. The New Testament will say the husband's wife doesn't belong, the husband's wife doesn't belong to himself, the wife's body doesn't belong to herself, it belongs to one another. So everything from spousal relationships all the way down to your ox, your donkey, your house, anything. The, the commandment, and this is the most serious of all the commandments because it's the one from which all the other ones are broken. All the other commandments get broken because this one was first broken. All, all the commandments to idolatry is rooted in covetousness. The New Testament says covetousness is idolatry. Um, when Paul quotes in Romans 7, when he's doing this rhetorical discussion of how the law came and its effect on humanity outside of Christ, he says the law said you shall not covet. He uses this commandment to sum up all of the commandments. And in Jewish tradition, this commandment was the one that summed them all up. And it was seen as the first commandment that was ever broken. When Eve ate the fruit, it said it looked good to her eyes, it looked pleasing for food. She saw it, she took and ate of it. That was seen by later Jewish rabbis and even in Christian tradition as Eve breaking the tenth commandment. Long before it was ever given in the heart, that's what she was doing. And so any of the, the commandments that we break, any of the sins that we commit, at their core, they usually, almost always, spring from desiring something in an improper way. And that's, covet just means desire. In fact, it's the same word. Covet and desire is the same word. Um, it's just, what are we desiring? Is, is it something that's, is it a proper desire? I can desire a better job, but I can't desire someone else's job at their expense. I can desire a raise, but I can't desire that I get someone else's raise that, and they don't. You see the difference? We can desire and ask for good things. I can desire a beautiful wife, and hopefully that'll happen one day. But I can't desire so-and-so's beautiful wife. That's the big difference there. So the Tenth Commandment is the most challenging one of all. Uh, it's the one that exposes the root of the problem, and it's the one that can't be legislated. But it's the last one God gives, and usually when there's a set, the first one's really important, and the last one kind of sums it all up. And that's what we have in the Tenth Commandment. The one that mostly gets ignored. Um, so we're going to finish out next week. We're out of time. So we'll look at the, the, the people's response to this. 
And then from here on out, in the next couple of weeks, this is where I want you to hang with us because we're going to look through these chapters in Exodus. This chapters 21 through 23 are the book of the covenant. It's their technical term. And these are the foundational laws then that God starts with and gives Israel. And they cover things like what we would think about all those big questions, slavery and violence and, you know, what kind of law is this? We're going to get into those passages that usually critics and atheists and others who want to knock the Bible and dismiss God. They'll cite those passages to show why he's not that great and why we shouldn't pay attention to it. So we're not going to skirt around them. We're going to actually read them. We're going to put them in their context and we're going to see what they said to Israel and then in turn what that can teach us today. But we're one minute over, so get back to your work, your jobs, but not your coveting. <laughs>